Happy Sunday to all our Sabbath Sunday homes. We are so glad and honored that you're joining us this morning. Can we take a minute and give it up for all of you who are hosting this Sabbath Sunday? We love you and we are grateful for you. So thank you for opening up your homes and invite all people to live the uncommon life that Jesus offers. We're going to dive into the message in just a second. But before we do, I have a few announcements for you. Life groups. Our summer life group session is in full swing, but there's still time for you to get into a group and do life together with others. Life groups are all about creating space of discipleship, building relationships, eating good food, and praying for each other. Some of the groups we have available are the men's group that meets on Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m., a young adults Bible study that meets Tuesdays 7 to 8.30 p.m., a group called Winning the Battle for Your Mind, led by Bob Rachel Gonzalez on Wednesday at 6.30, a group called How to Follow Jesus, led by Kaylin Pike, that meets on Thursday, 6.30, and a midweek Bible study led by yours truly on Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8 p.m. These are just a sample of groups we have available. To sign up, see a full list, text GROUP to 757-690-2401. On Common School of Discipleship, we have just graduated our first class from On Common School of Discipleship. What an incredible year it was. Students spent the past nine months intentionally growing as holistic followers of Jesus through classes, community, serving, growing in self-awareness, mental, physical, and emotional health, and learning what it means to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We want to let you know that enrollment for 2024-2025 on coming school year is open right now. We sincerely believe that God is calling some of you to take the next season of your life and intentionally invest into your discipleship and to know Jesus in a whole new way. To get more information about USAD, text USAD to 757-690-2401. And speaking of Uncommon, we want to remind you of the vision of LifeHouse. LifeHouse exists to invite all people to live the Uncommon life that Jesus offers by following Jesus, doing life together, getting in the game, and leaving a legacy. And speaking of legacy, thank you LifeHouse for helping us leave a legacy by faithfully investing each week into the vision. It is because of your generous and faithful giving that LifeHouse is able to impact hundreds of people each week with the uncommon life that Jesus offers. And part of leaving a legacy this month is our partnership with Coach Moore, who is going to Cuba in July on a mission trip. While over there, he will be purchasing bikes to help pastor shepherd their churches by having adequate transportation. Check out this video to see how you can partner with us in July to see a legacy left in Cuba. I thought family, it's Pastor John here. We're excited to let you know what we are up to in the month of June through leaving a legacy with our generosity. Right here, I've got Coach Moore with us. He's a part of our our LifeHouse family here, and he is taking a a trip to Cuba. And so I want him to tell us about that, right? We haven't been back to Cuba since uh, uh, COVID has come and, and changed the world. And we're anxious and very excited to go back and to bless pastors and uh, some ministry leaders, uh, all of our friends and brothers that we've been in touch with since 1999, uh, when ICM initially began the, the, the Cuba trip, and we're excited to be a part of that as well. So we're looking forward to going back and blessing some pastors and ministry leaders with some bicycles. So the way that we can get involved, LifeHouse family, is we're gonna actually be giving you the opportunity to sponsor um, a purchase of a bicycle for pastors in Cuba. They're $200 each, and, and a bike is the best way for pastors to get around on Cuba, or to get around in Cuba. So we wanna give you the opportunity to invest $200 in helping these, these pastors have a way to to go around and pastor their people. The best ways to do that is you can go to give to lifehouse.com and just choose the Cuba Bike Fund that you can give through Cash App as well. Just make sure you put in their Cuba Bike Fund and we'll make sure your giving goes towards that. We thank you, Lifehouse family. We love you, coach. I thank love you. you. We're excited thank to you. partner love with you, you to you. go and leave a legacy in Cuba and beyond. If you'd like to give today and invest in helping all people experience the uncommon life that Jesus offers, and these organizations above, you can go to give to lifehouse.com, give through Cash App at Lifehouse757, or you can see the ways to give in the chat section of whatever platform you're watching on. All right, the moment you've been waiting for, today we are continuing our Better Story series, and Pastor John is bringing the word today. Let's dive in. 
Well, good morning, LifeHouse family. So glad you're joining us today. Whether you're joining us for church online or whether you're joining us from a Sabbath Sunday gathering, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad you're here, especially if it is your first time. LifeHouse family, can we just welcome all those who are joining us for the, for the first time today? So glad you're here. If it is your first time, make sure you fill out a connection card. Let us know you joined us today. We want to send you a gift as a small way of saying thank you for joining us today. If LifeHouse is home, welcome home. Every Sunday is a family gathering, and we're so glad you're here. And just want to invite you, uh, if you are local, don't forget next Sunday, we're back in person at the Kill Creek Regal Theater, 9 and 1045. It's the fifth Sunday of the month. It's June 30th. A couple awesome things about that day. First, we're going to be concluding our Better Story series. We've been in that for a while, for two, three months. Excited to finish it next Sunday. And it's my birthday next Sunday. So I get to preach on my birthday and finish our Better Story series. So I want to make sure that you are, your face is in the place next Sunday as we conclude this series. It's going to be awesome. But today we continue the series by looking at the better story of John the Baptist. If you've got a computer or on your phone or something like that, write John the Baptist, John the Baptist in your chat section. Excited to look into his story. And we're going to see a recipe, a recipe for how God uses us, how God uses us. And before we do that, though, I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts. Number one, there's a cost to following Jesus. There's a cost of following Jesus, right? Even one of the things that Jesus says, he says, before you follow, like, like one of the things that he would tell crowds of people that were following him, he would say, hey, make sure you know there's a cost, right? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. There was this one portion where Jesus was teaching the crowds and he said, hey, make sure you count the cost. He said, make, he, he gave this example. He said, someone doesn't build a tower unless they make sure they have what is required to build it. And in that, Jesus was lovingly saying, just know that when you follow me, th there will be a cost. And we can hear that and be like, well, I don't want to follow Jesus if there's a cost. But also remember, I preached a couple weeks back that there's a cost of not following Jesus. Right? There's a cost of discipleship, but then there's a cost of non-discipleship. And there's a cost to not having purpose, to not having peace, to not having joy, to not having a firm foundation. These things that Jesus invites us into and promises us, there's a cost of not having that. There's a cost of following him. There are things we will give up, but in compared to what we give up to what we get, it doesn't compare. Jesus even told these parables, the, the, the parable of the great pearl and the parable of the hidden pearl that was in the field. And he told these, these parables to essentially say, hey, that when you understand the beauty of the kingdom of God and the treasure that living in the kingdom of God is, it does not compare to what you give up. What you gain is so much greater. And that's what I just want to start this, this, this time of John the Baptist with, because there is a cost of following Jesus, but there's a cost to not follow him, but also too, that as a follower of Jesus, many people, when they start to follow Jesus, then they have this desire to want to be used by God. They say, God, I, I want you to use me. Like, I, I, I give myself to, to you. And this is a great desire that we affirm. But what I have seen is that in people's desire to want to be used by God, they end up finding that there is a great cost to being used by God. That, you know, and, and, and you can even see it, right? Like, we're even inundated nowadays with pastors falling. And even this week, there's been two that... Um, just shocked me of, of just pastors that, that have really large platforms, but they have this, things have come out about them where they have failed, where they have morally failed. And there have been just people that are like, well, I see, this is why I don't go to church. And, and it's easy for us to look at those who have failed, like ministry leaders who have failed and point the finger and say, well, that's why I don't follow Jesus. And that's why it's a crock of stuff. And, and that's why this, that, and the other thing. But can I just encourage you and let you know that, that being used by God, whether it's in a ministry position or whether it's just as a person, there's a cost to that. Like it is, it is hard. It is not easy. It is not easy. And I would just encourage you that if, you know, to pray for your pastors, to pray for your leaders. If you hear of pastors falling or giving into moral stuff or to, instead of pointing the finger, would you pray for them? Because there's a weight that comes with ministry. That's one of the things that shocked me when I stepped into ministry is I was just amazed at the weight of ministry. Um, especially in a lead pastor position. Like that's one thing that I didn't feel like I was really ready for. It's just the spiritual weight you feel. And so I just want to encourage you that as you see leaders, that instead of pointing the finger and pointing things wrong, would you, would you pray for them? Because there's an extreme. And I don't say that to get sympathy. I say that to just be candid 
and real. But what we actually see from the life of John the Baptist is there is a cost to being used by God. There's a cost, but also with the cost, there's a calling. And what I found as I studied the life of John the Baptist is there's almost a recipe of what it looks like for God, that, that what is required for God to use us. And I want to talk to you today, five Ps, the most pastoral thing ever, five Ps, type five in the, in the comment section. Looking at the life of John the Baptist that I see are ingredients to the recipe for how God forms and shapes and gets somebody ready to be used by him. The first P is this. The first one is purpose. The first one is purpose. What you see that John the Baptist starts off with is that it was actually prophesied about him that he would come. John the Baptist is called the forerunner of Jesus, the one that came and prepared the way. If you read the Gospels, you'll see John the Baptist was, was the person that came and prepared the way for Jesus. He was the one, because the way it, it happened back in that day, when a king was coming, there would be somebody that would come and announce that the king was coming. There would be someone that would go into a city and essentially proclaim, there's a king on the way, prepare yourselves. And everybody in the, in the city would start to prepare themselves. They would clean their houses. They would make sure they had the right clothes on. They would, they, they, you know, they, you know, they would prepare food. They would get ready for the king that is coming. And so Jesus, who was, who was a king, who's coming to bring a kingdom, he had a herald, someone to go before him and announce that he was coming. And that's what John the Baptist played. This was prophesied in the Old Testament and became fulfilled right before Jesus stepped on the scene for ministry. John the Baptist came and prepared the way. So, but you can see that, that this purpose for John the Baptist was prophesied about him. And what I think it's important for you and I to understand is that we start with purpose. As a follower of Jesus, our inheritance is, is that we have purpose. I love what Mark Twain says. He said, there are two important days in your life, the day you were born and the day you find out why, <laughs> right? And one of the beautiful things that we inherit as a follower of Jesus is we have purpose just beyond this. Purpose just beyond a thing is we have a purpose that is greater than just what we experience. We have a purpose of knowing God now and a purpose of being used by him. This is, this is what gives our lives purpose, is knowing we have a purpose beyond just what we see, taste, beyond our five senses, is that we have a purpose to know God and to make him known. This is one of the beautiful things that we inherit as a follower of Jesus. I love what Romans 8, 20, 28 says, all things work to the good of those who've been called according to his purpose, right? Is that God has a purpose. We can see Psalm 139 where it says, where, where, where the psalmist shares that, you know, even in his mother's womb, that we are, that we are put together by him, that we are um, fearfully and wonderfully made, that there is purpose behind every step that God has. And that's what I see is important here that John, as you know, one of the ingredients that we see of being used by God is there is purpose. And this purpose was declared through prophecy. Let me actually read it for you. In the book of Luke, chapter 67, this is what it says. Then his father, Zechariah, so this was right after John the Baptist was born. And actually, John the Baptist's mother wasn't even supposed to have a baby, but, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, she had, she had healing in her womb and was able to birth John the Baptist. This After he was born, this is what it says. Then his father, Zechariah, was was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. And then we're going to go down to verse number 76. And it says, And you, my little son, so this is Zechariah speaking over his son, and you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. So what we see here, Zechariah's father is speaking prophecy over son. Can I just pause right now and, and say, dads, your voice is so important in your kids' lives. You have the power to speak life over your children. We see Zechariah here speaking life and prophecy over his son, John the Baptist. Can I just tell you, parents, especially fathers, how prophetic your words are in your kids' lives? Be careful about speaking death over your children. Speak life into them. Discern what the Holy Spirit is saying and speak life over them because just as uh, the scripture says, our words have the power of life and death. 
Jesus didn't create anything before he spoke. Our words have creative power to plant seeds in people's lives. Can I just encourage you, as Zechariah did over John the Baptist, he spoke purpose over him. He prophesied over him. There's something powerful in that. But we can see this is where John the Baptist, his, his, uh, an ingredient of the recipe was born is he had purpose. And can I just encourage you to let you know you have purpose as well? That God desires not to just know you, but use you, <laughs> right? This is such good, good news because you have to have purpose beyond this. So one of the things that I talked to Jackson about, my, so my son Jackson, and every time I talk about him, um, well, I'm, Jackson, I'm going to give you five bucks, okay? Because I know you're probably watching this at, at our Sabbath Sunday gathering. And so just know since I'm talking about you, you know, I'll, I'll give you five dollars to uh, use you as a sermon example. So Jackson loves money, okay? Jackson wants to make money. Actually, Jackson right now wants to quit school and start making money. And we were all having a conversation uh, driving to school one day. And I said, Jackson, you have to have a purpose beyond money. And he's like, well, what, what do you mean? I'm like, if money is your purpose, when you get money, you run out of purpose. And there was not enough money to give you purpose, right? He, he all, he want, is this like money? I want money. But, but, but just to be honest, so we all do the same thing. So we can want a job or we can want a relationship or we can want kids or we can want a spouse. We can, we, we, we can want things, right? And we can subconsciously not realize that is what our purpose is. So when we get that, we wonder why then after we get what we want so bad, we run out of purpose. It's because you were created to crave purpose outside of just existing. The God that created, the God of purpose who created you knows you, you're made in his image. You crave purpose. But your purpose is not to just get stuff and to just get whatever. It is to know the God that created you. So as I was talking to Jackson about this, he started to understand of money can be a great way to accomplish the purpose of God gives you money. If you make money, you can use the money to forward the kingdom of God. But money can't be its own purpose. Money can be a gateway to help you accomplish the purpose you were created for. But money itself, any, anything created, money, people, job, relationships, this stuff, the purpose can't stop there because you were created for more than that. I hope this is making sense because what you see is that John the Baptist's life started with purpose beyond just this. It was an eternal purpose. So one of the ingredients we see of being used by God, number one, is purpose. Number two, we see a process. We see a process. In actual um, Luke number one, verse number 80, this was uh, the writer Luke talking about John the Baptist. He said, John grew up and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. There was a process here. And just let me tell you, we, unfortunately, it's hard for us in our culture that wants to hack everything, biohack everything, efficiently get to everything quicker, faster. It's hard for us to understand process. But God is a God of process. Even John the Baptist, right? He grew up. He says he became strong in spirit. And then he went into the desert until the time where he publicly came on the scene for ministry. Y'all, as people of God, we have got to get used to, welcome, lean into, thank God for the process. What is the process? Many times it's preparation. We see he went into the desert, right? Well, what did we see Jesus before he came on the scene? He went into the desert. Moses wandered in the desert. We see the desert as a, in the wilderness as a formational important time in people who were used by God's lives. And like I shared with you when I spoke about Moses in the desert a little while back, the actual word wilderness in, like in the Bible means to listen. <laughs> Why? Because what happens in the wilderness, what is comfortable is stripped away to where you only have, you, you, you have freedom and you have space and you have availability to actually hear the voice of God. Some of you right now, you're walking through things and you're looking at it as a season of loss. Could it be a season of preparation? You feel like you're in a wilderness. You feel like you're in a desert. Could it actually be a part of the process that God is using to shape and form you to get you ready to be used in a mighty way by him? That is what, that is what we see. I, I remember part of my process of getting ready to step into church planting uh, was I had the blessing of working multiple jobs, working 65, 70 hours a week, working under houses, doing fungus treatments, putting in substructure work. Then I sprayed grass in a hundred degree weather. Like I, I had the opportunity while I was doing part-time ministry, right? Like I, I didn't realize at the time it seemed like torture. It seemed like torment. It seemed like purgatory, right? But what the Lord was actually doing was getting me ready in his process to where when I stepped into church planning, I had the work ethic to put in to see this thing work. And 
I, I just pray that this is why discernment is important because you could view a season as being a loss, but God could see it as a season of being part of the process and preparation. And that's why some of you need to shift what a win is because you're looking at the season you're in and you're viewing it as a loss when it's actually a win in the long run because it's, pre it's preparing you for what God has for you. And so, but what we see, one of the ingredients, when God gets somebody ready to be used mightily by him, he doesn't just give them purpose, then he normally gives them a process. Even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, prepared for 30 years for three years of ministry. Preparation and process was 30. Active ministry was three. Hope y'all see that. Okay, so one and I, I need to rush through these, right? Because it's Sabbath Sunday. I want to make sure we don't go too long, okay? <laughs> but um, okay, so we see ingredients to be used by God. We got purpose, process. Number three, we got place. John the Baptist knew his place. What do I mean by this? We're going to go to John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30. And I actually have a real Bible here. See? See this here? I actually got a real Bible. So John the Baptist knew what his purpose was. Like, like he, he knew his place. And his place was not to be the Messiah. His place was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And we actually see this, John chapter 3, verse 26 through 30. It says, so John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, he's talking about Jesus, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people, and everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. So his disciples, so John's, John's, John's disciples were like, yo, bro, it's like Jesus is getting more disciples than us. He's baptizing people. And this is, was John's response. He said, hey, no one can receive anything unless God gives it to him from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you. I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. You see, John the Baptist knew his place. He said, I'm not the Savior. I'm going to prepare the way and lead as many people to him as possible. This is so vital for us that want to be used by God, because if you don't understand, <laughs> or, or excuse me, what I find is that many people that want to be used by God don't want to prepare the way for Jesus. They essentially want to be the Messiah with a good heart and good intention, right? Of, of like, God needs me so bad that, that I have to be the Savior. And can I just remind you that in many ways, we are all just John the Baptist is being used by God. That we all are the ones that are called just to prepare the way and then get out of the way. And one of the actual recipes for burnout in ministry or burnout in life is taking on responsibilities that you were never meant to carry. And I can tell you this right now, like uh, as someone who's battled this and battles this, leading a church is there are things that I want to take on that I think I can control, that I can improve, that, that I can do, that only God can do. And where I feel the most weight is when I try to take on responsibilities and things that I was never called to carry. Essentially, I don't let God do his job. I try to do his job as well. And that's why I, th I think place is such an ingredient, an important ingredient in the recipe of being mightily used by God is you let God do what God can do and you do what only you can do. And you make sure there is healthy separation. Why is this important? You're, because there are going to be a lot of people, you're going to see a lot of need, and you're going to want to jump in and be everyone's savior. <laughs> Try to be everyone's Messiah. Even in your family right now, you have people... That, I, I, that you got so much need around you, you want to jump in and save them. But you have to ask, am I, God, are you, you, just because I see it, am I the one that you are calling to jump in and help here? That's why it takes discernment, right? Because you can, it's easy for people, especially they want to be used by God to see a need and want to just meet it. Just, just to see that, well, I can do something. And, and I'm not saying that if God invites you to do that and God calls you to do that, to do it, but at the same time, one of the reasons why people struggle and burn out is because they're trying to do everything and be everyone's savior. Can I just take that weight and burden off of you? That God has a specific calling for you? That you need to make sure you're tuned into him and hearing him on? This is what was beautiful about John the Baptist. He said, you know, his disciples can say, hey, Jesus is doing this. He said, that's, that's the point, that's why I came. I know my place, that's his place. And, and, and y'all, being used by God is going to be so important to know what your lane is and what God's lane is. And so I want to invite you in some of you today to take the burden off. Because some of you have unsaved family members, right? Some of you have unsaved children, 
Some of you have, have family members and friends that don't know God and you feel this weight to save them. Can I just encourage you? Jesus is the only one that saves. Jesus can use you. He wants to use you. But you have to know when you end and he begins. Your job could be simply being kind and nice and helpful and available and inviting and starting conversations, but ultimately, you're not going to talk anyone into it. It's going, it, it could be you're planting seeds, it could be this, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit that's gonna actually be the one to draw and to save and to move. That's, that, that, that's why it's important you know what your job is and what God's job is, and you know what your place is. You know your place, right? Ingredients to be used by God, purpose, process, place, Next, we see there's problems. Type in the chat problems. <laughs> if you want to be used by God, man, get ready to encounter problems. So let me set the scene for you here, what we see. Right, John the Baptist was the one who proclaimed, you know, this is the Messiah, right? He said, Jesus, you know, he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But John was also a prophet, so, so he was in culture and around. So there was actually a moment where he called out a leader in the city because he was with his brother's sister, and he said, that isn't right. You shouldn't be doing that. So guess what happened to him? He got put in prison. And while he was put in prison, you actually see in Luke 7, verses 21 through 23. Let me go ahead and turn there. You actually see John the Baptist is in prison. And while he's in prison, he has these moments of doubt where he was the one that said, hey, this Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, say, you need to follow him, I must become greater, he must become, or excuse me, I must become less, he must become greater. But then when he hit problems, I even think he had a season of like, is this Jesus really who he says he is? So, so, we, so we see, he sends a couple of his disciples to Jesus, while, like I said, while John the Baptist is in prison. He sends a couple of his disciples to Jesus and asks them, are, are you really the one we've been expecting? And I'm like, how could... John the Baptist asked that when he was the one that proclaimed, this is, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How could he send a couple of his disciples to ask them if Jesus is really the Messiah? But what I think John the Baptist was encountering is as he was in prison, he maybe experienced some doubt. And I, I just want to encourage you to know that as you're being used by God, that does not eliminate the probability of doubt in your life. Matter of fact, sometimes being used by God will create more doubt. I'm going to have moments and seasons where, is, is, is this really it? Am I really doing the right thing? Is God really good? Is God really faithful? And in your doubting, you, you will be tempted to see that as sin. Let me just encourage you. Doubting is not sin. Doubting is called being a human. And I love the, the times in Scripture we see people encounter doubt, Jesus' response to doubt. You remember Thomas? Thomas was called Doubting Thomas, that Jesus rose from the dead. The disciples said, hey, we've seen the Lord. He said, I'm not, unless I see his hands and his feet hands in his side or, you know, holes in his side, hand, holes in his hands. I'm not going to believe it. Jesus came up to him and said, hey, look here. He answered his doubt, right? Doubting is not sin. Doubting is called a part of following Jesus. But what I want to encourage you to view doubts as is invitations from the Lord to go deeper. Because this is what doubts have the power to do. Doubts to me are sirens. It's time to go deeper. You need to get deeper and a more of a firm foundation in him. And typically the doorway to greater faith, the doorway to making Jesus more of a firm foundation is listening to your doubts and saying, let me go down this rabbit hole and see what is beneath this doubt and inviting the Lord into your doubt instead of running away from the Lord because of your doubt. Y'all, that's, that's so good because some of you right now are experiencing doubt. You're like, am I a Christian? Do, do I really love Jesus? And it's not those things. It's that you might just be in, in a season where the Lord is saying, hey, it's time to go deeper with me. Okay? We see this in John the Baptist. Being used by God mightily. He encounters problems, encounters doubt. And this is what Jesus responded to him. He said, at that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and he restored sight to many who were blind. Then he told John's disciples, he said, hey, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those who with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. And he said that little phrase right at the end to say, John, listen, don't be offended by me. John, don't fall away. Hang on. And that's what I feel like some of you need to hear today. 
is hang on. You're in a season of doubt. Don't let that doubt define you. Go down the rabbit hole of where that doubt is. Look into the variables that are contributing to that doubt because to me, it's an invitation from the Lord saying, I want to know you more and I want you to know more of who I am. I want you to have greater revelation. Hope y'all hear my heart on that. Even as you're being used by God, doubts can creep in. But just know those doubts don't creep in to take you away from him. They're invitations to, to go deeper with him. All right, we got the ingredients, the recipe for being used by God. Purpose, you got a process, you got to know your place. You're going to encounter problems. And the last one is this, the price is pain. I wish I could tell you John's story ended great. And this is what you find with people that want to be used by God. Unfortunately, many times, at least in scripture, you see their stories end with pain. John the Baptist was beheaded. <laughs> Like I said, I wish I could make it clear. I wish I could make it a little less, um, a little less painful. But ultimately what happened is John the Baptist, like I said, he spoke truth to power. There was a leaders back in the days, why, you know, the, the, he was with his brother's wife. John the Baptist said, this, this ain't cool. So the woman that this leader was with didn't like that John the Baptist said that and called for his head. And then the king said, okay, I'll give it to you, girl, since that's what you asked for. So John the Baptist was beheaded in prison. That's how his story ended. But if you go deeper than that, let's just be honest, man, that sometimes being used by God is painful. Especially if you are a truth teller. I don't know if you know this, but the appetite for truth in our culture is, we have a gag reflex towards it. And if you are going to be used by God to tell the truth and to tell people this is what the good news is and this is what right is and this is what truth is. There's a price for telling the truth. And I just want to encourage you to just know if you're going to be used by God, there's a cost. And sometimes the cost is pain. And being in ministry, I can tell you this is true. But even so, some of you experience pain at your workplace. Whenever you say, I'm a Christian, whenever you say, I follow Jesus, whenever you say, I'm not going to say that, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do these practices, you can be persecuted, you can experience pain. Even if as a follower of Jesus, it doesn't exclude you from pain in your life. But what I want to say is, is that one of the ingredients that we see from, I mean, even in the life of Jesus, right? Jesus was perfect. He lived the will of his father and the will of his father ended up in him being crucified is that the will of God doesn't always lead to a life of ease and comfort. Many times it leads to pain. But, I'll, but I want to remind you that in that pain, there's purpose. I just want to remind you of the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus was talking about the Beatitudes, talking about what life in the kingdom of God looks like. In verse number 10, he said, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In verse number 11, God blesses you when people mock you, persecute you, lie about you, and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Persecution in the United States is obviously probably going to look different. You might not lose your life, but you might lose your, your reputation. All right, persecution can look different in different places. But I felt like sharing this with you just to let you know that one of, one of the ingredients of being used by God is many times you will experience pain. So know when it's painful, know it's working. And this is why I encourage you to pray for your leaders. Pray, pray, pray for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for them. It's easy to point the finger. But man, when you're in the fight, you want to be prayed for. So... I feel like inviting you today to be used by God. We see as God used John the Baptist, there is ingredients here that we're all going to have. But just know that we all are in many ways John the Baptist. We're called, we're prophesied about to go and prepare the way for King Jesus. It's called to be a herald as John the Baptist was of, of saying the King is coming. Let us prepare and get ready for his coming. But if we're going to be someone that takes that invitation, we purpose, process, place, going to encounter problems and it's going to be in many ways pain but God has purpose in the pain because he's going to shape us and form us to be like his son Jesus Christ I'm at 30 minutes so I want to pause and pray and just pray over you because my heart and prayer for Lifehouse Church is that we would embrace purpose that we would embrace the process we would know our place that we would look at problems from God's viewpoint and that we would say hey if pain is a part of the cost of following him following Jesus. It's more than worth it because we have a Savior that endured the ultimate pain for us. 
All right, so I just want to pray over, over you, pray God's blessing over you, pray that this message, that it didn't scare you, but maybe you heard and, and you didn't feel more burdened and great that God, the Lord wants to use me, you would feel calling, you'd feel purpose, you would feel something rise up within you of, in the midst of your normal, everyday job, vocation, kids, ball fields, uh, grocery stores, all of these ways that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is inviting you to be His hands, His feet, to be used by Him. What a glorious joy this is. So I just want to pray over you. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for those watching. Those watching, whether it's they're watching church online or whether they are joining in from a Sabbath Sunday gathering. Lord, I pray that as we've learned today from the, John, from the life of John the Baptist, Lord, you can, there's a process to be used by you. Lord, that we can step into purpose, step into a process, that we can know our place, we can have problems, but see them from your viewpoint, God, that we can know that there's pain, but there's purpose in the pain, Lord, that we would step out, take the invitation to be used mightily by you, to be your hands, your feet, your representation to everybody around us. So, Lord, Holy Spirit, take this message, help it land where it needs to land. We love you so much, and we honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen.